Oh, it's so silent in here. Yeah. Come on, you're at a live event. How exciting. <laughs> Loosen up, folks, on, on this incredibly depressing topic. Um, so I'm just going to move We're going to have a little a introduction and then. OK, go for it. Go. Hi. Who's Kara? Kara, right. OK. Great. Hi, Matt. <laughs> uh, hello there, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Cole. I'm a receiver here at Politics and Prose uh, Bookstore, where we now host 1,000 events a year. Uh, between this location and uh, Zoom, where we can have people join us from all over the world and, and create that interconnectivity that we're all looking for. Uh, for a full list of future confirmed events, you can go to our website, politics-pros.com. Uh, and before we get started today, I'd just like to ask you guys to take this time to silence your phones if they're not already, um, so that we're not going to get disrupted. And in lieu of our regular Q&A format, uh, everybody who wanted one should have been able to grab a note card and a pencil. Um, and we'll be collecting those shortly, and those will be asked at the end. And in light of ongoing COVID protocols, all books have been pre-signed, and we ask that you respect the author and not approach them for personalization after the event. Um, and then once the event is complete, just a little housekeeping, we ask that everybody fold up their chairs and then lean them against this wall uh, and then exit through the back. So now that all that is done, without further ado, uh, tonight I'm very excited to welcome Elizabeth Williamson celebrating the release of Sandy Hook, an American Tragedy in the Battle for Truth. This is the work of a humane investigation into the tragedy that follows tragedy, as people who dub themselves truthers, but in reality do not acknowledge the truth try to change the narrative of events that have actually occurred and heap further pain onto those who have already experienced too much. It also examines how the misinformation and conspiracy theories and the people who promote such things that found space in our country after Sandy Hook have emboldened groups to reject the facts and existence of white supremacy, COVID masking and vaccinations and the validity of our elections. Elizabeth Williamson is a feature writer and former editorial board member from the New York Times, and she has previously written for the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Williamson will be joined in conversation tonight with Kara Swisher. Now, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Williamson and Kara Swisher. Thank you. So uh, I like that you have to do the work afterwards. You have to clean up. That's my favorite part of this, that introduction. Um, so Elizabeth and I have been talking a lot over years about yeah. this topic. It's a topic that's been sort of, um, I wouldn't say near and dear to my heart, but I w have been especially troubled by what's been happening in, with online uh, uh, social media particularly and how it's uh, sort of congested, uh, weaponized, and amplified hate. Um, and obviously, one of the first instances of this, uh, and something I know very well, was uh, Sandy Hook. Um, there's a couple instances of this. Oddly enough, today, the reason I'm late, I was interviewing Kathy Griffin, uh, who, as you know, uh, got investigated, was put on the no-fly list, et cetera, et cetera, and then became subject of death threats and stuff like that. I know she's funny, but her story is not as funny as she is. Um, and so you see it iterating in little places many years ago, and Sandy Hook was probably the most reprehensible version of it, although, January 6th is, is in competition in terms of, of how much um, the, um, our, our society and our, uh, the way we talk to each other has changed so dramatically, including with conspiracy theories running wild uh, and, be, and becoming part of the body politic, including, um, including ev everywhere, just everywhere, uh, whether it's election lies, anti-vax, um, Ukraine right now, you're seeing it a lot in the Ukraine um, with the Russians. Right now it's a bioweapon, whatever. It's, it's one lie after another that then gets amplified. Anyway, this book is amazing. Um, it's depressing, um, but it's also very clear um, what, what we have to do about it and stuff like that. So I'd love, I'm excited to talk about this. I'm going to read just very quickly, I think, the key line um, um, that, that I think is important. Then I'd like to start from there, Elizabeth. Sure. Driven by ide ideology or profit, or for no sound reason at all, conspiracy theorists would use technology to create, to create it to unite the world to hunt and attack vulnerable people. It has happened many times since, but Sandy Hook was the first mass tragedy to spawn an online circle of people, impermeable and hostile to reality and its messengers, whether the mainstream media, law enforcement, or families of the dead, for whom the torment, 
torment by deniers added immeasurably to the pain. The book's the decades distance, Sandy Hook stands as a portent, a warning of the power of the unquenchable viral lies to leap the firewalls of decency and tradition to engulf accepted fact and established science and to lap at the foundations of our democratic institutions. This book tells the truth of how it happened. So let's start with that. I want to talk, we talked about this when we were on Twitter spaces and stuff, but talk about how, I want to get into how, what happened and focus yeah. on Alex Jones and others, but talk about the bigger picture for people here in terms of, of why this was, uh, as you said, a canary in the coal mine. I yeah. interviewed Len Posner, whose son Noble was murdered. Right. Um, so talk a little bit about that. Sure. So Lenny Posner was a Sandy Hook dad whose son Noah was the youngest Sandy Hook victim. And Lenny had a tech background. Um, he was interested in computers when the computer industry was in its infancy. He really knew how the algorithms propel lies um, onto social media platforms and um, speed them um, to millions of people. Um, so he was the one who told me, you know, this isn't a one-off that you know was maybe spurred by Sandy Hook being a watershed moment in the gun control battle, for example. Um, what this really was was a foundational story of how misinformation moves um, and how people were willing, as we say, like a group of people were willing to just deny accepted truth and fact and, and science. And so it moved from Pizzagate to QAnon to coronavirus to January, the, to, to January 6th, and then there we were at the steps of the Capitol. I mean, I remember I was, you know, in January of 2021, I remember I was trying to finish, you know, the last couple of chapters, and I was thinking, I'm procrastinating a little here, but I just want to see what's going on at the Capitol. So I turn on CNN, and people were scaling the walls of the Capitol, and I was thinking, well, I guess this would be the last chapter in the book because mm -hmm. it was exactly the same delivery methods, often the same characters and people who were spreading these lies. So, so, so talk a little bit about how it started, the, how it began, because Len Posner, it was quite an interesting interview to do with him. Yeah. But one of the things is it sort of, he himself was interested in conspiracy theories, yeah. whether it was around, what was the one he was, the moon landing? Or? The moon landing. Yeah, there's yeah. The, conspiracy the theories code. aren't Da Vinci Code, right? Yeah. This is not a new thing, conspiracy. They've been around since the beginning yeah. of time, essentially. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things I learned was, um, you know, America has always been a conspiracist nation. And, you know, one of the historians that I spoke with, Catherine Olmsted from UC Davis, was saying, you know, we're a nation of immigrants, and we sort of define ourselves and create our own identity by defining the other. Um, and then that, taken a step further, means demonizing the other. Um, and so that was something that sort of drove people. But this was a little different. It wasn't just keeping a check on government or saying, you know, well, government does lie. I mean, we have historical right. instances of it happening. Right. This was never trusting the government and always distrusting the official narrative and always seeing, you know, that narrative as something to be denied. Right. So it, we, there have been plenty of things that the government has done over the course of years yeah. lying about various things. Vietnam. You can go. You, there's dozens and dozens of examples. Yeah. But what 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 happened here was began well before this. Was it in the Reagan administration when it said don't trust government? Where did it have its beginnings? This this conceptual idea that birthed Alex Jones, who then grabbed onto whatever conspiracy theory yeah. among them, January 6th for sure. But yeah. but he initially got started on Sandy Hook. Yeah, Alex Jones kind of had his roots in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so. He was always distrustful of government. He sort of identified with a sort of white Christian nationalist um, movement out west. Mm -hmm. um, after the Branch Davidian uh, compound siege near Waco, um, he rebuilt the, the Davidians' church. He raised $93,000 for that effort and a group of volunteers. So he had strong ties to that world, which almost by definition was distrustful of government and, you know, keep out of our business. And he appealed to them. And he was a celebrity among that crowd. And they were kind of his core audience. And, and why did he get that way from your perspective? You know, it's hard to know. I really struggled with trying to define, you know, who is Alex Jones. Um, 
He's but everybody knows who Alex Jones is, correct? If you, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which wasn't the case, actually, right? right like right. seven years ago, people didn't, you know, this entire room would be like, well, I don't know, I'm coming up empty. Um, yeah, I, it's hard to know exactly. He, he is conspiratorial by nature. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, one of, one of his employees told me, it doesn't really matter if Alex Jones believes what he says. It matters that his listeners do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were millions of them, and they were willing to defend those false beliefs with violence. And he was operating on the fringes of media at the time. And I yeah. remember interviewing, I was perfect, I was completely struck by it, but I, oddly enough, had Ralph Reed at uh, one of my early code conferences, because I was re noticing that the right wing was doing rather well yeah. online. And it was because they had been zeroed out of other media. And so here they found a very fertile ground to get their information. Talk radio was another area. But which was Jones, which was yeah. Jones, but 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 and is. alternative media was what they were looking for mm -hmm. in some fashion to yeah. get the word out and kind of undercover because nobody really paid attention yeah. initially to talk. As Lenny radio. called it, he called it, you know, I liked to listen to Alex Jones when I'm driving between clients because he represented the other side of information. Right. But that was before Alex Jones got as dark as So he, he liked, did. what did he like about it? The silliness or the... the he liked thinking, it, it, to him it was an intellectual exercise. You know, what if we looked at, you know, what the government said about the moon landing? Mm -hmm. And we look at what the conspiracy theorists say. And we can just kind of, you know, figure out how are they, how's the sausage made? You know, mm -hmm. how do they figure out, like, what, you know, What's the basis for their doubt? You right. know, these photographs, these mm -hmm. footsteps, right. you know, he thought it was fun just to kind of look at those things. Right, and he didn't think it was toxic in any way. No, because at that time, Alex Jones, for all of his, you know, associations out west, mm -hmm. he definitely was a different person. You know, he was a lot less toxic and dark right. than he was around 2012. Right. So it shifted from that, those kind of things to more of a propaganda angle, because I think one of the things that I hate is the idea of calling it fake news. I just think propaganda is yeah. really what you're talking. Is it propaganda or is it not? Yeah. Um, lies would be another Lies word, uh, is yeah. another way to put it. Some, <laughs> but some is, are purposely yeah. done yeah. for propaganda purposes. Yeah. Absolutely. Correct? And sometimes propaganda, I mean, uh, to drive an agenda. To drive an agenda. Uh, and it can be not necess negative necessary, necessarily. I mean, a lot of what Zelensky's doing right now is to, to sell this underdog 100%. story, which is, it, he is in fact an underdog, so it's yep. actually true, but there's a lot of bells and whistles that go along with that. But right. I'll get to that in a second. So the, so the idea was that this guy was doing this stuff and sort of living along the edges yeah. and needed something to take himself upward. So explain how that yeah. happened. So this tragedy happened, yeah. um, in, in unimaginable for, yeah. for, most, for everybody. Um, talk about how it unfolded. Sure. So with vis-a-vis -vis Alex? Vis-a-vis -vis the whole incident and then how, mm -hmm. why this one, because there's lots of, in, lots of shootings. Why did this one yeah. get that kind of attention? So obviously, as everyone in this room knows and can probably remember where you were when this happened, um, it was just an unimaginable crime, you know, the slaughter of 20 first graders, you know, trying to hide in their classrooms, and the six women who tried to protect them. Um, and initially, even the parents themselves couldn't countenance this, you know, and, um, the people around them, um, and you know, they they told me about how you know they'd wake up even today, and say some mornings, um, oh, that was a nightmare, you know, um, and then realize no, actually, it's my life, mm -hmm. and so I think there were a number of people who congregated online, um, especially moms who had children around that age. And they this just, is astonishing. Yeah, yeah, they just couldn't believe it. They, they would show up at the Sandy Hook hoax Facebook group was one of the biggest denier groups at the time. Mm -hmm. How many people were, were on the Facebook? Sandy there were Hook? hundreds. hundreds yeah. yeah, they would gather at night. Um, they would talk all night long. Um, they would show up, you know, usually after work, um, come in and out, and just exchange their theories. And we talked about this. Mm -hmm. You know, the earliest Facebook groups were. Quilting and knitting groups, people mm -hmm. who had this AOL common. groups, actually. Yeah, before yeah, yeah that, exactly. Before that, I told her a story about when I met Steve Case one of the first times. 
he made me go meet a quilting group that had been had made a quilt for AOL online <laughs> and they it was lovely they were lovely people who yeah. had an interest they brought them all to AOL and they they kept sort of stroking Steve Case and they gave yeah. him cookies and it was lovely it was yeah. lovely but then it turned soon turned uh, it turned very ugly rather yeah. quickly but it was that was the idea was that yeah. that communities of people would come together online. It was very active among gay people, for example, who were mm -hmm. uh, couldn't get together or were unsafe, yeah. et cetera. Now, of course, they're unsafe in Florida again. Um, <laughs> so what, it was really problematic. You know, it was a great way to solve a problem of people like-minded people yeah. or like-minded interests. Yeah, building each other up, connecting right. with one another. So this is what help. happened. It was the same kind of. It thing. was the same. That's the eerie thing because it really was the same kind of impulse. You know, let's gather online. Let's each, you know, add our piece to the quilt. You know, where were the police helicopters? Why were the victims transferred by ambulance instead of by a helicopter? How did that happen? Why did porta potties show up at the scene? Mm -hmm. You know, did someone plan in advance? What were the police doing? Who was in the woods? Everybody contributed some little piece of this crazy quilt that these Sandy Hook hoax Facebook people were building. You know, this, this like, Lenny calls it conspiracy blob. So yeah. every new he fact called it a that party. emerged, it was like a party. And yeah, th this has a history in crime because yeah. you know there's you know the, the 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 Golden State Killer. They were there. There's there's all kinds of stuff around. Yeah, police work that actually ends up. Yeah, there were a lot of true crime groups right. at the time. In fact, some of those morphed into the Sandy Hook hoax group. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was just building this this whole body of conspiracy. But some of these young moms showed up on there, and they just thought. You know, I'm here for anybody who could tell me that somehow this didn't happen. That they didn't happen. So they're yeah. worried about their own children. Yeah. So it sent um, them into they just it theories. was well, Lenny described it as a form of PTSD. Right. That that these these particular individuals and you know, I think we all suffer a little of that, you know, but that was one part of the group. Mm -hmm. They fell away pretty quickly. They were pretty easily convinced when Lenny himself actually joined this group one night to try and present the records of Noah's life and death, his birth certificate, his post-mortem exam, his school records to say, look, here I am, I'm using my power as a grieving father, I'm gonna answer your questions, I'm gonna give you this material, mm -hmm. you can examine it, I'm happy to answer any question you have and a lot of these younger moms were convinced. In fact, they started to DM him and you know, kind of join him in a separate group. Mm -hmm. But then that left the sort of rump group of really hardcore conspiracists. And they were egged on by Alex Jones. Yeah. So he then took a hold of this. And what yeah. happened? So those individuals became Alex Jones's content providers. Mm -hmm. right. So they were the people who were showing up at Newtown two dozen times, Wolfgang mm -hmm. Halbig, or they were people who were following the families around or sending endless public records requests, trying to get grisly details of the crime and photos and whatnot. And publish them. And publish them. And they were people who just were harassing the families to no end, both online and increasingly in person. Yeah, which they would show up because this couldn't be true. This is, we're going to yeah. prove it, as if yeah. it's a detective novel. Yeah, and the other thing is, you know, when you have people, just like the AOL thing, when mm -hmm. you have people in this tight, cohesive group, building each other up, supporting each other, exchanging information. And these are people who would normally be isolated. You know, they were the person who would hand you a Xeroxed sheet of theories on the subway before, mm -hmm. or, you know, your crazy uncle who would, you know, corner you at the family reunion mm -hmm. with his JFK theories. But now they found each other through the magic of social media. Right. They all found each other. They exchanged their theories. They created this very tight knit social bond among themselves. And so anybody who was there to say, no, actually, this is the truth. No, this is what happened. No, here are my documents. Whether they were a first responder or another participant or they were a parent, they were villains and they were threats. And they, could, they would break the, what they were doing because they, what they had to be doing was righteous. Yeah, presumably, and entertaining yeah. also, because yeah. a lot of these people and leave. it was a, a form of um, psychic income that they'd never gotten before, and also income income. So talk about an income, income. Talk about the money Alex Jones made uh, at this. I'll get to the platforms in a second, but he started yeah. talking about it incessantly. And again, when people say just asking questions, 
you really have to wonder what's going on. Yeah. That's an excuse it's, uh, for a lot of stuff. It's very famously, Tucker Carlson does it, uh, but lots yeah. of people, I think Joe Rogan does it sometimes. And a lot of people are saying. Right, yeah. a lot of people are saying and just yeah. asking questions, Yeah. Um, which I never say, by the way. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> of course I'm asking questions, but, um, but, but talk just about, well, yeah, I'm just asking questions here. <laughs> so, but they're based in fact, as opposed to Tucker Carlson. Anyway, um, and I'll throw Sean Hannity in too. Um, so when you when you when he was doing this, he was making money. So he started doing it, and it, yeah. it looked good for ratings, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I often decry people who are like, "Oh, clickbait." I'm like, "No, it's not really. We're not really yeah. doing." It. But in this case, he saw the numbers. Yeah. Correct. So when Alex Jones started getting called on the carpet for this um, around 2014, 15, 16, mm -hmm. he had two things. One was that. He didn't come up with these theories. He was only repeating the claims of others, mm -hmm. which is false. If you listen to his broadcast from that day, which of course I have, within hours of the shooting, he had started to say, this is, an, this is a plot to get Americans guns. So mm -hmm. that was false. And then the other thing was, I never made any money from this. As a matter of fact, these kinds of controversial theories um, I, I lose listeners when, the, when I put the, well, that's absolutely wrong. Between 2013 and 2016, his audience doubled to 50 million viewers a month. Wow. Yeah. And money? And the money, um, he, you know, so the first thing I had to go on were records from his um, divorce mm -hmm. in 2013, 2014. And there he, w he had his personal income was $5 million a year. Mm -hmm. But now some records have started to emerge just in the last several days, actually, that suggest that during the Trump presidency, which was when Alex Jones was really riding high, um, he, was, he had revenues of more than $50 million a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so $50 million this yeah. time, most, much of it uh, Sandy yeah. Hook. Correct. Right. Genius business model. Right. Um, yeah. All he was doing was he sells products that are absolutely geared to the paranoia and the fears of his audience. So it's dried food for your doomsday prepper shelter. Yes. Yes. It's untraceable gun components. So you've got a weapon. You don't need to register when the end of times comes. Mm -hmm. Um, it is um, vitamin supplements and diet supplements for people who don't trust traditional medicine. It's fluoride-free toothpaste because the fluoride the government puts in your water is meant to rot your brain. Right. So, so he sells this stuff out from a warehouse out back from his headquarters. Million, crazy. $50 million a year. Right. So he's taking advantage of his customers and also with yeah. crappy products. And yeah. at the same time, using crap to sell that crap. Yeah. Okay. Got yeah. It. Okay. It's like it's a often a good business plan. I'm sorry circle. to say, yeah. crap circle. Closed but crap you know what? Circle. It works. Uh, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he then, of course, used social media platforms to do this. He did, he wasn't just you know. Yeah. He also appeared on a lot of. Reg he started to appear in mainstream media, rather. Right. You know, whether it was a Megyn Kelly show, he was on Joe Rogan. He was on a lot of different places. Yeah. Um, so that was one part, but online was really important for him. And he used it, the same tactics for January 6th. He's, turns out to be he's one of the organizers. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about that, how he mm -hmm. moved to the platforms, and then what the platforms did or did not do. Sure. So his early business model, again, pretty genius. Um, he, he modeled it after Gary Allen, who mm -hmm. in 1971 wrote this sort of seminal conspiracist tome called None Dare Call It Conspiracy, kind of blaming a global cabal of bankers saying that they're the ones behind American policy, um, not elected officials. Um, he used to sell his theories, and he was a, a, a real darling of the John Birch Society, the far right um, Birchers, and mm -hmm. he used to sell his theories on, at that time, video cassettes, um, cassette tapes, and he did it through mail order. And that was how Alex Jones started. So mm -hmm. he and Kelly Jones, his ex-wife, would create these feature-length films from Bohemian Grove and uh, railing about the globalists or whatever. And mm -hmm. they would not only send them out to you if you, if you, you know, contacted them like mm -hmm. by their phone or later on their website, they encouraged that people who bought them, pass them around, let all your friends see right. them, spread this. Right. And that was exactly the verbiage he was using during 2020 in the run-up to right. the insurrection. But instead they were using these platforms, which are much mm -hmm. more effective than yep. a cassette tape. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. which was exponentially, obviously, right. faster. Right, and one yeah. of the arguments that, that the, um, I'm going to, 
read you something I wrote, and I'm not going to tell you when I wrote it, but, but in a minute, in a second. But one of, they went there because these were platforms that allowed them to do this at a much faster rate without yeah. any tracing and any, um, any kind of editorial yeah, total function. total anonymity. Right, yeah. and anonymity. So talk about that. So you started to do that. Yes. Len yeah. complained to these platforms. Right. It's, now, I'm not surprised, but explain what happened. Okay. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah right. absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, Lenny compares it That's to That's how standing. many laws there are governing any tech okay. companies, just so you know. Zero. Goose egg. Actually, one is very good for them, but go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So he... Uh, Lenny um, tried to get this material taken down. So mm -hmm. every, just to back up for a sec, um, Alex Jones's material, he started to put every broadcast on YouTube, um, and his YouTube, pay, his YouTube videos were racking up a billion views, for mm -hmm. example. Um, he had a Twitter account. He had all the things that everybody has who wants to spread this stuff now. Mm -hmm. um, so he just exponentially increased his reach. Um, and that kind of prepared him for where he was in the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he had doubled his audience. Um, he had, you know, put this stuff all out online. And who was more powerful, Twitter or Facebook? At that time, I think it was, well, actually, YouTube was one of the most powerful That's right. For him. There's three of them. Yeah. And there's the three yeah. that are the most important yeah. is those yeah. three. So he was putting his videos on there. He was doing yeah. that. And people were sharing um, them. And what were the platforms doing? Nothing. Explain nothing. Sure. Because so, Len, uh, Lenny, when he started to yeah. see this, couldn't believe it, yeah. right? Couldn't believe. So Lenny, having realized that trying to debunk these hardcore oh, oh, conspiracists, um, having realized that that wasn't going to work, um, he, the first tool in his toolkit were, were our copyright laws. So he had a memorial page to Noah that had photos of, of Noah with his sisters, video, family videos. He owns that stuff, but the conspiracists were going on and taking that, lifting that material, and putting it into their videos or onto their websites or whatever. He used the copyright laws, the DCMA, to get that stuff taken down. So that was the first real effective thing. But when he went to appeal to them directly, he, he got an automated message. He couldn't even, he described it as like standing in front of iron doors and you're knocking and no one can even, you can't even make your knock heard, much less anyone opening to you. Right. It was just completely futile. So they couldn't get that except when he went to copyright, correct? Exactly. So they, they couldn't appeal to, this is a bunch of lies, my children right. just died, they're making right. things up. No. This is a bunch of lies, et cetera. The, no. this, w this got no reaction from any of them, None. correct? None. So we went to copyright, which yeah. they do, which they are familiar yeah. with. And, and they're concerned. bound. They have they to have take it down. That's the only law that they're bound by. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. What did, what did you think of this, and what did he think of this? Were you, so you called me like, Kara, yeah. why are they doing this? I'm like, <laughs> would you yeah. like a chair? Because you know, <laughs> yeah. they can. Because yeah. they're unaccountable and ungovernable. Not, right. They are not to be governed by anybody but themselves. Exactly. And as you said, you know, these are, your, your uh, analogy about Facebook just sticks with me, that Mark Zuckerberg has built a city without police, without fire department, without sewage treatment, without trash pickup. Yes. And we all have to live in it. And he gets all the rent. And he gets all the rent. From our movements around yeah. that city. It's yeah. called The Purge. It's a very good yeah. movie. You should enjoy it very much. <laughs> um, so w what happened to shift that? Because he did get them to mm -hmm. start to pay attention, right? So but it took as a you've lot also of said, yeah. public shaming was, and there was a, the, in the book there is a really great incident where Kara interviewed Alex Jones, or no, Mark interviewed Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg yeah. about Alex Jones, um, asked him, you know, I bet... It, it, before you even sat down with him, before they were even recording, said, you're going to take down this material. You're going to take down Alex Jones. I'm yes, predicting I did. it. You're yeah. going to deplatform him. I said three weeks. You're yeah. going to deplatform him. And, and he was like, no. He said, no. He yeah. said, that's ridiculous. I'm not. And I said, yeah. oh, no, you are. And he goes, he essentially said, who's going to make me? And I'm like, me. Yeah. Um, many so you others. brought it up in the interview. I brought it up right away. Yeah. And right. thinking that he would avoid that question of the, the thorny question of Alex Jones, Nice segue right over to the Holocaust. Yes, that yeah. was a, an unfortunate Holocaust move denial by him. Yeah. being basically, oh, those people are just mistaken. No, he said they don't mean to lie. 
Yeah. And I felt it was a definition of a Holocaust denier yeah. that they actually mean to lie and malevolently. Yeah. And so what happened in that case, and I want you to react to this, is yeah. I wasn't surprised by what he did, what they did, Facebook yeah. did, was when he moved from out, he said, we were talking about Alex Jones, and he didn't, he felt uncomfortable because at the time it was getting a lot of attention. Yeah. And he said, you know, let's move on to the Holocaust. And I was like, no. Okay. Don't yeah. do it, Mark. I, was, I felt bad as a parent. You I told was like, me that. Don't do it. But then that I'm was like, in an earlier version yeah. of the book, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, do it. And one of the things yeah. I did was not speak. Interrupt. Yeah. I did not interrupt. Yeah. And I, I wanted to say, when he started to say Holocaust deniers don't mean to lie and therefore should be able to say what they think, instead of saying, you fatuous popinjay, of course they mean to lie. That's their right. whole game. I said, oh, interesting. Uh, please go on. Go on. Go on. Um, <laughs> were you surprised by that? Because you were right in the midst of this, that, that, that this was, he, he actually said the quiet part out loud, which yeah. is a way of putting it, right? Yeah. yeah. It's just like what Facebook used to say back in those times or, or a little earlier. Mm -hmm. We'll never play by China's rules. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? So this was something that Lenny really picked up on. Mm -hmm. um, and he did an op-ed in which he called Zuckerberg out on the Holocaust lie um, and on, gee, you're not even protecting people who are targeted by Holocaust deniers, and we're even lower down the food chain. Um, and that got a real reaction. Right. And within a month, Alex Jones was off of Facebook. Right. Well, only because Apple did it first. And right. they all have Apple envy. They were like dominoes. Yeah. yeah. It was because Tim Cook did it. Yeah. And then Twitter you, did it. And then the me, others. Yeah. And the others. But they weren't going to do it without yeah. Apple doing it 100%. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, talk about, we're going to get to some questions from the audience. Where are we now with this has happened? This is, um, I think you've moved from surprise that they're doing this to what, yeah. what, how it ended up. Because the, the yeah. Sandy Hook hoax page is gone. Yep. What about all this material? What was really interesting is the Sandy Hook hoax Facebook page was gone, but when we did our first conversation about the book on Twitter Spaces, the Sandy Hook hoax Twitter account suddenly disappeared. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. two weeks ago. Yep. So it's pretty amazing how little they do to try and police these platforms. And do you give them any excuses to, to of why there's so much information? Because it's happened in... Uh, COVID, it's yep. happened vaccines, yep. it's happened elections, it happened January 6th, it's now QAnon. starting QAnon, Pizzagate. of course, yep. uh, Pizzagate. Um, Other mass shootings. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what do, you, what do you imagine has to happen? Do you think things have improved or people, because they're trying to sort of starch their black hats white in this Ukraine thing right. by immediately pulling it down. They didn't wait for me or you to yell at them, like, please do this. I used yeah. to call myself the... Um, the call center for these places, you know, yeah. The, yeah. the kind of thing where I would call and say, uh, the one I had is when I called, it was Cheryl Sandberg, and I said, Hillary Clinton is not a lizard. I have met yeah. her. She's yeah. not a lizard. Can you take down all this, these conspiracy theories that yeah. she's an actual lizard and it's under her skin and da da da? Yeah. And it led to, it ultimately, led, and pedophile and this and that. Yeah. So what do you imagine they're going to do now? What do you think is going to happen? Uh, Lanny is, doing this group where he tries to do and he's tried yeah. to expand it. Yep. What happens next from your perspective? Well, on Alex Jones, mm -hmm. so at the end of last year, right. there were four separate defamation lawsuits filed by the families of 10 victims. Mm -hmm. um, Alex Jones has lost those suits because he refused to cooperate and to give his business records or to provide adequate depositions. So he basically just defaulted himself. Um, and so they won. So it's a sweeping victory for the families. Um, but it means that now in the spring, just in a couple weeks from now, the trials will begin. So juries will set damages. Um, so it's just damages. So, it, they so he's just, lost. All that he's lost, and all the juries have to do is decide how much he should pay them in damages. And he will, of course, declare bankruptcy or? Well, he's already scurrying and running and, and setting up and, and juggling a web of LLCs that he has to try and hide his income. And then the, the, sort of the pain that these families continue continues. It, it's it still continues. around. Yeah. 
But now I think it's moved to a policy level because sadly they're joined by many more people who right. have been wronged by this same thing. Right. And you know there there are some interesting moves on on Section 230, which is the legal shield that these platforms have that keep them from being sued for defamation themselves. This is a very early law part yeah. of the Communications Decency Act that protects gives broad immunity not just to tech companies, but it was meant to allow the nascent internet to take off. It was yeah. a very good, it was by Ron Wyden. It sure Wyden. did, right? It did, yes yeah. it did. Uh, it w w and the question is, if you pull it off, what will happen? Because yeah. there's also some very good arguments for not doing so. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you imagine will happen? Will we continue in this sort of information desert full, that's full of information or data? And rattlesnakes. Or, yeah, and rattlesnakes, yeah. yes, it's a, it's a desert full of yeah. rattlesnakes. What do you imagine happening? And then I'm gonna ask some questions. Okay. You know, I think it's anyone's guess. I mean, I think the reason that I wrote this book and that I was so compelled to get this into the world is that, you know, these families shared with me the worst day of their lives mm -hmm. um, because they really feel like if people read this book and get mad, they'll begin to push for some kind of policy change. And I think that, you know, that's what I hope for. A policy I mean, that's, change. Yeah, that I and think what would there that has be? To because be, it does run up against you know, the It's person. like what, what Lenny told you in your Sway interview, mm -hmm. you know, the Department of Information Security. You know, would, would, would a Department of Information Security be able to police these platforms or at least try and come up with some no. kind of broad fixes? Mm -hmm. I mean, we could be pessimistic about this, but um, at least people are talking about it and mm -hmm. there seems to be some bigger brains in the room now. Um, mm -hmm. And it does seem that the platforms are not able to just shut those iron doors on anybody with a complaint anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lenny's heroic in that he got their number. Mm -hmm. You know, he really felt like, I'm gonna, you know, he, he I'm gonna make this my life's work, you know? Mm -hmm. But is it really fair that a grieving parent should make it his life's work after losing his son to get these platforms to behave themselves? Right, exactly. And this is ongoing. How old would Noah be? Uh, well, um, Noah would be 15 this year. 15. In November 20th, he would be 15 years so old. So this is how long 16. they've been toiling. 16, that's yeah. right. It's the age of one of my yeah. children. Yeah. Um, let me, I'm gonna read you something because I want, cause I, I want you to answer the final question I have here in this thing. Yeah. I'm not going to say when I wrote it, but I'll tell you at the end. Okay. And it says, it's so, it was about Trump and Twitter, about whether they should take him off. He had violated all the rules almost continually. Yeah. Um, he's the most high-profile example of yeah. someone being deplatformed, but he just broke the rules. That's all he did. Yeah. Uh, they every can use day. any word they want every day, yeah. but that's all he did. He broke the rules. Yeah. Their rules that they don't enforce. Okay. <laughs> it so happens in recent weeks, including at a fancy pants Washington dinner party this past weekend, I've been testing companions with a hypothetical scenario I made up. My premise was, uh, had been to ask what Twitter management should do if Mr. Trump loses the 2020 elections and then tweets inaccurately the next day and for the rest of the month that there had been widespread fraud and moreover that people should rise up in armed insurrection to keep him in office. Most people I posed this question to had the same response, throw Mr. Trump off Twitter for inciting violence. A few said he probably should only be temporarily suspended to quell any unrest. Very few said he should be allowed to continue to use the service without repercussions since he was no longer the president. One high-level government official asked me what I would do. My answer, I would never have let it get this bad to begin with. I wrote this in 2019. This was fully a year and a half before this happened. I got called by all the executives at these companies and said, how dare I create such a terrible scenario, which of course is exactly what happened. Right. So how, how did it, how does it not get, how did it get this bad to begin with? And to me, this was the moment. Yeah that if we tolerate not just guns, but this yeah. information, and how do you think we fix it? <laughs> yes, you're in charge. Oh, yeah, queen for a day. Um, I don't know, I don't know. I, I do think these platforms are so enormous that you know they obviously can't police themselves. I think even with their, and we talked about this when I interviewed you for the book, that mm -hmm. it, it's, they are so large that even if they wanted to, even if they were forced to, they wouldn't be able to remove all this content. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I mean, it, it is the kind of question that makes some of the big thinkers out there in tech say, blow it up and start over. Yeah. So, 
I don't know. Do you think blowing it up and starting over would be a better solution? Um, you know, Jer Jaron Lanier, who I think is one of the smartest thinkers on it, said it's the biggest uh, uh, experiment in human communication and it's failed. Yeah. You know, there are some people, I have a Star, Set, Star Trek, a Star Wars theory, where I think it started off as Star Trek, where everyone gets along, you know, this yeah. multiracial group of people get along, and even the villains get turned good, you know? Yeah. And then there's Star Wars, where everybody dies, really. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, nobody comes out well. Right. And all, the empire all, is always striking back. Yeah. I think we live in Star Wars. Yeah. And I'm not sure what to do about that. Yeah. So, um, so let me, let me ask some questions. This is, is this Jen Jennifer Griffin's here? Oh, the woman who's doing God's work. We love you. <laughs> Jennifer works when for Fox Jen News. When came in, I was like, oh, uh, Kara's going to be so happy. Yes, yeah, she's amazing. <laughs> I've, been, I've been tweeting uh, love letters to her on the internet, uh, on Twitter. Um, because Using your powers for good. Well, it's God's work, what she's doing over there at Fox. Anyway, a fantastic national security reporter. She's wonderful. Um, was there ever any Russian link to Alex Jones? What percentage of his shares uh, were bots? And to what degree uh, is Russia behind this explosion of conspiracy theories in America? Great question. Very pertinent um, right yes. now. Yes. So Alex Jones, we left this part out of our narrative, um, was a regular on RT. So he would get up. In this is Russia Today. Yeah, Go Russia ahead. Today, um, Kremlin-funded state TV. He would get up in the middle of the night. You know, his ex-wife told me, clamber out of bed, you know, ready to go on RT at all hours. He was eager to expand his platform by whatever means necessary. Mm -hmm. um, he's been a Putin fan and apologist from the start. Um, he admires that. And I, I actually think, and, you know, Paul and I have talked about this. When I was a reporter in Eastern Europe, it was, you know, even then, not terribly long ago, um, it would have taken a pretty sophisticated foreign adversary like Russia to sow the kind of disinformation that we are doing ourselves. Yeah. And if we're worried about Russia interfering in our next election, don't worry about it because we've already done it and we'll do it again. Right. So it's our. It's now yeah. we're these groups yeah. in this country. Yeah. But was he funded? Now talk about bots. Um, it's, one of, you know, I asked him about um, when I interviewed Alex Jones. I asked him about Russia and RT, and he went absolutely bananas. It was the only time during our interview that he truly lost it. And what? How? And it made me wonder. You know, where? What is your relationship there? Mm -hmm. It was either that he thought just that association mm -hmm. would sort of ruin him with his audience. Or there is something there. But I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist myself. Right. Yeah. I don't really know. Yeah. So, I did a little yeah. bit there. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but the bots are something interesting. Um, but to what degree was Russia behind this explosion of conspiracy? Very much so. Yeah. Very well, look at so. what, you know, what really struck me the other day. What did Russia say about that maternity hospital that was bombed yeah. in Ukraine? They said that the w pregnant women being evacuated were, were crisis actors. I mean, that is absolutely And, and the foreign minister the said, he, script. said Russia had been canceled. Right. Yeah, you're exactly. damn right they have. Anyway, um, uh, it was ridiculous to use a term like that. In, yeah. In a, it was crazy. But, you know, they, they gloried in, you know, Russia has, you know, loved to, to, and that was one of the reasons Alex Jones was on there early, was to talk about, you know, American mayhem. You know, there's nothing better than to broadcast news, you know, outside in Russia about American gun-related mayhem. Yeah. Um, and that, so you know, he was that's welcome a there. He was, yeah. well, he's a, he was a, what do they used to call it, a fellow traveler. Yeah. Anyway, um, so one of the things about bots, just Jennifer, you want to know, I did a, a story, there's it's a bunch of good companies, but um, remember Roseanne Barr said that terrible thing? And then uh, Samantha B. a week later, said something not very nice about uh, Ivanka. The bo they were the same bots ginning it up. They, they were like, can you, they, getting on both sides of the Roseanne thing, saying, she's right. Um, and then, no, she's terrible. And they were right. all from the same company that, that yeah. were doing it. And then humans get involved. They're like, oh, look, a fight kind yeah. of thing. So the bots started the fight. The same companies did the same thing with Samantha B. So they had no political, they just wanted to create mayhem, which right. to me felt like it was the internet. Uh, what was the thing in Russia, the, the, that group that does this? That, oh, IRA. Yeah, IRA yeah. that does this. Yeah. And Russia uses contractors. They also do, ro meaning they hire these people for ransomware and things yeah. like that. It's not just that, it's iterated other places. Yeah. Okay. What groups are disproportionately affected by these conspiracist lies? Minorities, women, low income, LGBTQ, et cetera. 
Well, yes to all those, all but the go above. ahead. Yeah. So, and how? Yeah, really all the above, because um, an essential element of a conspiracy theory is, is demonizing and division. So you pick a group and you hold them out. And in the case of Sandy Hook, it was the families, the first responders, everybody who sort of represented the kind of good of the case, the facts and the truth. And um, and in in all of these other theories, you know, I mean, Alex Jones is a master at this. You know, Immer I mean, every time he's been sued, it's because he's demonized a certain group. You know, uh, Hamdi Lukaya from Chobani Yogurt. He said he was importing immigrant rapists into yeah. the United States. Yeah. Um, so it's always about demonizing one of these groups. One of these groups, and whatever it happens to be. But they yeah. don't care, right, presumably. It's just whatever sells. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, and enragement is engagement. Yeah, that's yeah. my big line. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in public spaces recently about the restoration of trust in America. Based on your reporting, Elizabeth, what do you believe we need to do to improve trust in American institutions like the media, government, and each other? That's a big question. That's a big question. We could have a whole another program on that. Well, actually, the conflict in the Ukraine is very interesting. Bringing together yeah. NATO again, most yeah. people agree. Yeah, which is a sad, There's, pathetic way to get back. Yeah, to that kind of um, unity it has a salutary effect, of course. I mean, one of the worrying things is the erosion of trust in the mainstream media, because, you know, as one of the Sandy Hook lawyers put it. If there are no arbiters of truth, then anybody can be an arbiter of truth, and that's what this is. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, meaning that everybody has their own set of facts. This yeah. is also how to restore trust when people do not even agree on a basic set of facts. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, do you have I, an answer? I wish I knew. I yeah. really wish I knew. Yeah, it's a really interesting issue when everyone's getting different. They're in silos. Yeah, it's something Mark and I used to talk about. Was he's trying to bring everyone together? I'm like, all you're doing is creating silo after silo, right. and not just on, it happens on cable news, it happens everywhere. Yeah. Media literacy, what age to start teaching young people uh, it and how, and are adults a lost cause? <laughs> the young my mother is <laughs> I, I pointed her to you Jennifer quite a bit I I'm like you should listen to that nice Jennifer Griffin she's the ultimate oh, boss. stop listening to this <laughs> jackass is that Craig whatever fuck his um, name is how do we restore the trust in the media? Um, yes. Or media literacy, media when do we literacy. teach people? As early as possible. Yeah. Um, and I do see a healthy, even among my own boys who are both here, um, mm -hmm. I see they? It, they, David is 18 and Charlie is 25. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, they're like, now, now tell our birth dates. Well, oh. you get, you're like, uh, 25? You were yeah. there, presumably. Yeah, I was there. I was there. They both just had their birthdays. Okay. So All I'm right. still doing last year's math. All right. Okay. But, but yeah. what do you set your point they, being besides they are forgetting your They're highly age. skeptical both of their own use, you know, in their yeah. own use, and also of what they read online. And I think that's a really I healthy think, I positive. think Gen Z, my sons are, two of my kids are um, and how old 16. Are you? I have four kids, but yeah. uh, 16 and 19, uh, the older ones that can, the others yeah. can't read yet. Although <laughs> I had a big argument with Rick Grinnell last night. He's like, you think the baby knows more. I'm like, the baby can't read, Rick. Like, it was a weird <laughs> Twitter fight with that idiot. Um, so, Why like, bother? She, her tell is that she thinks her baby can read. I'm like, OK. <laughs> right, I'm not gonna, but they have the same thing, this idea yeah. that young people are more critical of yeah. believing anything yeah. online. And there's some really, in the book, there's some really interesting research on something called pre-bunking, which mm -hmm is about oh. teaching people how the sausage is made so that they can recognize the elements of a conspiracy theory and they're less likely to share it and more likely to report it. Yeah, and make so, it harder to share it. There's yeah. a lot of things, do you really want to do this? Do you really yeah. want to share yeah. it? Yeah, and I, I love that. It, that's a study done out of, and a lot of work mm -hmm. being done out of Cambridge. And I think that's so fascinating because it uses that, I mean, one of the things that drives some of these conspiracists is this, possession of superior knowledge. So if they feel like when they get online, oh, well, I've done this little study and played this game because they've mm -hmm. done it through online games. I know what that is. You know, they kind of use their own character traits in mm -hmm. order to turn them against conspiracy But, but do you think some of these warnings that they have on, like Twitter has one on, like if you're angry, do you sure you want to share it? Do you yeah. sure you want to do this? 
You sure you believe it? Yeah. Maybe you haven't read this. I'm sort of like, that's like putting a Twinkie on a plate and saying, you sure you want to eat this? Right, I, I know, know, exactly. No. Yeah, or, or a bet, not a Twinkie, go, a nice Oh, you're right, croissant. Twitter. Let me just hang on, click through that. Yeah, let's before. not eat that croissant. Yeah. You're going to no, eat that croissant. No, it's like yeah. total instant gratification. It's such a waste. It's, it's the least possible thing yeah. they could do and, a, yeah. and typical of them. It's virtue signaling. It's exactly. Um, I, don't know, I don't know. It's just useless is what it is. Can you talk about how you discovered this story and decided to pursue it? That's an excellent question. Yes. Um, so in mid-2018, when the first two, uh, well, the families of two Sandy Hook victims, two children who were killed, it was Lenny Posner um, and Veronique De La Rosa, Noah's mom, um, and Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis, who were the parents of um, Jesse Lewis, who also died at Sandy Hook, when they sued Alex Jones for defamation in Texas in mid-2018, I thought, this is a very interesting test of the First mm -hmm. Amendment all around. Um, and that's when I first got involved in it. But that was, you know, um, when I went to talk to the lawyers and then I spoke with Lenny, that was when I realized this is a much bigger story even than these families saga. Their, their, their awful saga is what is symbolic of what we are all gonna live through in our communities if something isn't done. Okay. What is your sense of the moral equivalency culpability of social media companies who simply claim to be providing a platform for a multitude of voices, meaning we're just a benign platform? Right. Um, how is Mark Zuckerberg no worse than Alex Jones? Is it arguable that he is worse given his clear goal to profit from facilitating propaganda, lies, and hate? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm going to ask that one of him, but go ahead. He's never given you another interview. No, he's since never that going Holocaust to give me. Thing. No, he hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, but the parlor guy did. That didn't turn out well for him either. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> oh well. The um, yeah, I, you know, you could argue. I could see why people argue that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's one thing to know. Yeah. Okay. We have great. time for one. Great. Okay. okay. We'll we'll quote quickly. Okay. Go ahead. Maybe go finish it. Too. Okay, we're going to see. Yeah, it I mean, we're not really I think that, that that's a legit argument. That right. you know, he knows what's going on. Yeah, um, he, he. It's been too long. He knows what he's created. He yeah. just can't control it. And he's he's one of the richest people in the world. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to ask one more question. Let me see which one. Let's see. They're all so good. I know. Um, Sorry, we didn't get to more. That's okay. I think this is the same email, one. Email. Email me. Yeah, it's, uh, these are the same one. Okay. I'm going to read them both, and then I, it's kind of a tough question. Did plunging into a very dark aspect of human delusion and cruelty change your view about our society, leave you more or less hopeless? And how did you keep uh, despair at bay while writing this With book? With hopeless as a baseline, right? right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> more or less. Uh, uh, how did you um. keep despair at bay while writing this book? <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth, because it's an incredibly depressing topic. Yeah. Um, you know, I always feel a little uncomfortable when, and a lot of people have asked me that. And in fact, I was just telling Lisa Dickey's story today where a woman I know said, hey, that woman over there in the salon, she wrote this book about Sandy Hook. And that woman was like, God, she must be a downer. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, no, I'm not a downer. She's not a yeah, downer, I'm I can a, attest. I'm a Midwestern Pollyanna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, actually, Who's being did... eaten apart inside, no, seriously. Yeah, what, what, yeah. What, dying uh, a slow death. Right. No, actually, no. You know, and I will say that it was the grace of these families. Mm -hmm. They, I, I mean, I always say when people say, oh my God, that must have been so hard. I, I just say, imagine living it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, they shared this, as I'll, I'll say it again, you know, they shared these moments because they want all of you to do something. And to me, that is like the most inspiring thing. They have hope that things like what Kara does or this book will inspire somebody to take some action. So they have faith, actually. You know, despite all of these efforts to undermine our democracy, to lie about the deaths of their children, they believe, they still believe. And so how can we give up? How could I? So last thing, what can these people do? What can they do? Write your congressman. Um, I, I think that it's, it's, well, first thing, read the book. Um, as Robbie said the other night, we did a book event, Robbie Parker, um, Sandy Hook dad said, I would encourage people, you know, this is hard material, but it's not too hard that you can't stand it. Um, and take it on, read it, um, and then get pissed. 
and you know, contact people who can make change, whether it's the social media platforms or it's members of Congress who are starting to grapple with they this. They are, 100%. They are, in a bipartisan way. It's one of the few bipartisan efforts that is actually taking root in the Congress. Well, yes, so, it was before this, the conflict, yeah. but yeah. It's yeah, definitely before, so, yeah. So, so you're saying get angry. Yeah, yeah. I hope people, you know, people say, you know, I don't mind, a, a radio host said to me the other day, I don't mind telling you, this book made me a little mad. I said, that's absolutely the goal. Yep. Yeah. And also, think about what you're carrying around. You're, you are a, I always say you're cheap dates for the internet. They get all the money, they get all the data, and you mm -hmm. get a dating service, a map, or whatever. Understand um, what they're doing, what they're doing. It's not unlike uh, opiate uh, companies or the yeah. Sacklers, who are exactly. also giant pieces of shit. But, um, but it's not unlike that. Yeah. It's not unlike, it's because it's addictive, and this, is, uh, this pandemic has shown us, it's addictive, it's necessary for your job and your life and your social life, and it's run by the richest people in the history of the world, running the companies that are the most valuable companies, the top 10 companies, except for Saudi Aramco, which might be vaunting forward after this crisis. Mm. The top 10 companies in the world are tech companies, valuable. The top richest people in the world, except for the Saudis, richest people in the world. Just keep that in mind. That's your money. Yeah. That's your, they're, they're eating, they're, they're yeah. you know, Soylent Green is people. Yeah. Let me just say, think about it Demand like that. they fix it. Yeah. Anyway, Elizabeth, this is a book you really should read. Do not look away. Uh, what's happened to these parents and the kind of, you're right, the grace that they have is really inspiring. And uh, don't let them down. Elizabeth, thank you. Kara, thank you. Thanks for coming. All right. Um, so, thank you very much thank for, you. for thanks for having us for the book, thank for the conversation, for the questions. Um, just the housekeeping reminder. I know it's.